So I think we're going to start a few minutes early just because it's, uh, it's a little over capacity and I actually thought it was going to be 50 minutes instead of 40. They were, they were all 50 last year. So um, I may actually go through a little bit faster because I want to leave plenty of time for people to be able to ask questions. Um, I think uh, one, of, one of the great things about these conferences is actually being able to ask questions to people who are doing this uh, in the real world. So I want to make sure I leave a lot of time for that. So my name is Ryan Richard. Uh, I work for Rackspace uh, Private Cloud. Um, this talk is going to be for some of the things to think about as you're looking at like designing a private cloud. Um, let's see. If we could hold off the questions till the end, that'd be great. Um, like I said, I want to leave a, a lot of time for that. So the first question might be, is why Folsom? So the, the title of, of this, this talk is a, is a Folsom update. Um, last year I gave one and really focused on Essex because we had been running it for six months for customers. So we've been running Folsom for six months for customers. So I wanted to, to provide some best practices for that. Uh, so at the next design summit, we'll do the same exact talk, talk except with the uh, best practices we've been doing for Grizzly. Uh, I think Grizzly is going to be a huge one. There's a, there's a lot of really interesting things coming in Grizzly that I'm sure you guys have heard about. I'm gonna, there's going to be a slide at the end where I'm going to touch on a little bit of the, a little bit of the Grizzly features. All right, so just to get started, I want to define what the like what is a private cloud. One of the uh, one of the things that, that I feel like we could we could focus a lot of time on is 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 sort of the, the goal of, of your private cloud. Are you actually building like a, a private cloud that's going to be elastic in, na in nature? So you're going to try and mimic one of the public cloud models, or are you just really looking for like a cheaper version of traditional virtualization? Um, in, in reality, I think you need to pick one. OpenStack does both. Um, it probably does the elastic one a lot better, and it's certainly not a, a drop-in replacement for, say, VMware, right? And, and if you think that you're going to be able to simply, you know, install OpenStack, move your VMs over, and, and everything's going to be the same, I think most people in here probably know that, that that's simply not the case. Um, so certainly one, the first thing to, to figure out is what you're actually looking for. Are you looking for elastic, or are you looking for a traditional virtualization? Uh, the next thing for a private cloud is, is it is most likely multi-tenant, but not necessarily at the organization level. It's multi-application, right? So each application, each application stack might be a different tenant. Uh, but certainly, in a in a, in when we think about tenancy in a public cloud, it could be you know x number of of customers or x number of uh, different organizations. Uh, size for this talk, I'm going to keep it limited to about 100 nodes and under. I, 100 nodes feels kind of like a breakpoint to where architectural, architecturally it's a, it's a lot different. Uh, pre 100 nodes, it's it's somewhere around 50. It changes a little bit, um, but uh, after 100 nodes, it it definitely starts to feel bigger, and there's more considerations af after that size. The the endpoints for a private cloud may or may not be public. It's certainly um, certainly acceptable that your endpoints for all of your your Nova services and all of your OpenStack services are they're in, in private space. The public internet can't reach them, right? Uh, limited inbound, inbound connectivity, that kind of falls the, the same line of thinking there. That's uh, instances might be only accessible within your organization. Uh, they have accessibility out to the internet, but, but perhaps there's literally no, you know, no accessibility in, uh, where this is where floating IPs come into play. Um, and then the, the last piece is certainly is, is customizing for specific workloads. I, I feel like that's probably the biggest selling point for a private cloud over any public cloud is the ability to customize it for your needs. So that could be things like specific images, uh, specific flavors, specific hardware. Right? Most likely, the hardware is probably probably one of the biggest selling points. So I wanted to to think about what it meant to be like uh, when you sort of start looking at sizing a uh, private cloud. And we start, start thinking about the resources that every compute node has. Uh, really, the, ultimately, we, we look at vCPUs, uh, RAM, and, and hard disk space. There, there are more, of course, right? There is network utilization, network throughput. Uh, but these are really sort of the big three. Um, so if we take the, the, the default flavors, uh, and we start with the smallest one available, which is the M1 Tiny. These are just out of the box, OpenStack flavors. Uh, that's 512 megs of RAM and one vCPU and a disk size of zero, uh, which is essentially the, the size of the image that you're using to boot. Uh, if we were to fill up one entire compute node with 
this is what it would look like with just those, with those number of instances. So the, the RAM to CPU ratio is way off, right? I'm consuming all my CPUs, I'm using almost no RAM, and I actually don't know how much disk I'm using because my disk size of zero, I can't, I can't plan for that, right? Um, total instances on, on something like this is about, is about 48. Now, realistically, we're probably not gonna be running 505, a lot of 512 meg instances, but um, there's certainly a, an occasion where you might do that. But again, the, the big issue here is that the, the CPU to RAM ratio is, is just, it's way off. So let's take the medium, for example. So if we uh, think about the number of instances with a with the M1 medium flavor, it's using four gigs of RAM and two CPUs and about 50 gigs of disk. This is much more, much more um, possible workload. You'll, you'll actually see this. Uh, once I've consumed all CPUs, I'm using most of my RAM, which is good, uh, and I'm using about half my, my disk space, not bad. Uh, that's, that's a lot closer, that's, that's really what we want to strive for. And if we think about something on the other end of the spectrum, which is, uh, you know, heavy RAM, maybe a 64 gig uh, image, uh, you know, eight CPUs, 100 gig disks, here I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum. I'm consuming all my RAM, but I'm not, really, I'm not really consuming my cores efficiently or my disk space efficiently. And I'm only got, you know, I'm only running two instances on here. So my thoughts, what that leads into is, is some of my capacity thoughts. Um, initially is don't allow a disk size of zero. So you have to really start thinking about like yourself as a service provider. Uh, you're actually acting as a service provider for your internal teams, right, for your internal applications. If you allow a, a disk size of zero, you're actually not gonna be able to plan for capacity at all, right? Because how big is image X or image Y? Like you don't, you don't actually really know. Uh, most people try and keep them as small as possible, maybe seven, 800 megs, but you, you don't really know how big they are. And you think about a public cloud model where they, they limit flavors based on resources. So um, I work for Rackspace, so I'm pretty familiar with our, our public cloud model. And if you look at our resources of our flavors that we use, the, the more CPUs, the more RAM, the more disk space you get, right? So they're, they're, for capacity planning reasons, that makes life very easy. They know exactly I can fit this num number of instances on this piece of hardware, right? The, the trick is in a private cloud world is that everybody ends up doing the second thing, which is they add flavors for application workloads. So you could think of a, of a RAM heavy application workload like a, 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 an indexing service or some sort of caching service, right? Um, if you run a lot of those, your, your, uh, you know, your capacity might, might be underutilized in one way or another. So I think, there's a, I think there's a middle ground that we have to figure out, which is do you act like a public cloud person, a public cloud provider, and you only give your internal teams access to very prescriptive uh, you know, size flavors so that you can understand capacity and trending really well, or do you go more flexible and do you allow them to create flavors that match their workloads? I, I don't know the answer. I think that that is, is specific to every company. Uh, everyone kind of has to make that decision. Uh, lastly, don't don't forget about network utilization. I, I think that's often overlooked. Is is to, you know, people kind of forget that, you know, you have only X number of gigabits per second on a compute node. Uh, it's certainly not something we want to forget. Uh, with the private cloud model, trick there is 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 if you are going to go that way, um, watch the, you know, watch trending very closely so you understand where your capacity is going. Uh, certainly, if you find that you have one application workload over another, um, plan your next set of hardware for, you know, maybe, maybe better for the application. So if you're very RAM heavy, go up on RAM and less on disk. So the, the, that, is, that is the trick there is that I can always add more machines. I didn't realize this is cut off in the edge. Um, but I can always add more machines, right? We can always add more compute nodes. Compute nodes are extremely easy to add. Uh, I, I, hopefully everyone in here knows that. Uh, if you haven't stood up your own OpenStack cluster, compute nodes are probably the easiest thing that you can add. Um, with, our, with our chef recipes that when we deploy a compute node, assuming we've already set up the, the operating system and networking takes about two minutes. It's not, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't take very long at all. The big trick is in, uh, without quantum, is you can't change the fixed network once, it's, uh, once instances are already running. So that's something I, I, I talk a lot about in, in this discussion is because pre-quantum, it's extremely, extremely prescriptive uh, with the fixed IPs. Uh, 
Uh, VLAN mode it opens that up a little bit, but it, it's still you still have to define a fixed VLAN. And once, or excuse me, a fixed range. Once you've defined it, you can't really change it uh, without destroying all of your VMs and recreating, which is not something anyone's going to do in production. There, there actually is um, some ability to define multiple networks in Folsom, uh, even in flat DHCP without VLANs. You can do it. Uh, I, I don't necessarily recommend it, but it can be done. Uh, you, the dashboard doesn't respect it, but if you use the CLI or API, you, you can do it. So it's something worth looking into if, if, if you're going to be running Nova Network and you want to break up network space. Uh, if you, along those lines, if you have two, uh, if you have two networks with the, you know, um, on the same interface, if you just boot an instance, you're going to get an IP out of both networks. Uh, if you specify which network you want, you'll get an IP out of only that network. So this is uh, something that I had last year. When we think about resource you know, consumption or resource utilization, uh, you basically take the resource, uh, divide that by you know, the, the, that resource in your smallest flavor. Uh, it really gives you the maximum number of instances per machine. Again, that's, that's just something you need to think about for, for when you're defining the fixed range. Right, if I define a fixed range of 512 um, IPs, that's the most instances I'm ever going to get in my one, my one private cloud. Um, so you really need to think about what flavors you're going to offer, how many of those can be running, and then you probably want to actually double or quadruple that just for growth, right? So we, we actually, most of our customers, I, I think we start somewhere uh, 1,000 or 2,000 just out of the gate, you know, even if it's a very small private cloud, uh, just to get going. So just to, just to keep going on Nova Network for just a minute, uh, there's really there's two networks in play, and there's three networks in play if, if you ha are going to use floating IPs. Certainly not everybody actually needs floating IPs, but they, they, actually, they do come in very handy. So the host network is extremely easy to deal with. It's, a, it's, it's your, how you access the machines. You know, changing or adding the host is really not, not too big of a deal, um, or even growing that work, network's not, not that hard. Uh, the fixed network, like I said, is, is really the important piece. You really don't want to try and change this once you're in production. That, that will, be, uh, um, it will be not a fun experience. If anyone's, if anyone's had to go through it, you probably know. Uh, and the last one is the, the floating IPs. They're extremely easy to add. There's concept of pools. It's more analogous to how quantum is doing networking in the future. Um, but you can essentially add a, a pool of floating IPs. And then if you need more, you can have another pool, create those, and those will be available to your users. Also, uh, assigning a, a floating IP um, completely changes the way connectivity to and from the instance happens. So I'm actually giving a talk tomorrow at 11.50 uh, just on Nova Network. So not quantum. It's just going to be Nova Network for, to kind of go in some of the details of you know, what's actually happening behind the scenes. Uh, so if you guys want some more information on that, I'm, I'm giving another talk on, on Nova Network tomorrow. And there's also a number of quantum talks this week. I highly suggest going to those as well. All right, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and, and talk a little bit about images and, and storage. We, uh, we, we've started making some images that, that we can give our customers. Um, and as the bottom says, there's one of my team members is actually giving a talk on this uh, tomorrow at 1.50 in room C123. Um, but this is essentially what we've chosen, which is, I think, probably what most people have chosen as well. Um, as far as drivers go, we're, we're sticking with Verdeo for now. We've gone with the QCAL2 format, um, a bare container. Uh, I think people are either between bare or AMI right now. Uh, cloud init uh, and partitioning, we, we try and be as, as dynamic as possible. Uh, there was a talk in here earlier about uh, how to deal with images. We basically, um, you need to be able to move the partition table around. Uh, if you're using AMI, you can, you can put uh, everything on a, a full block device, and you don't have to move a partition table. That way, when you boot, you can just uh, resize the file system. Uh, and the other models, you really can't do that, so your operating system needs to know how to move that partition table. Um, so we, we've done that in our images. So I'm calling that dynamic, so that the partition table moves out, and then when the instance boots, CloudInit uh, resizes the file system for you, and you're able to gain those, uh, get, you know, make use of that extra space. The other thing with uh, QCAL2, 
as was touched on earlier as well, is that um, it's uh, there is a bit of a performance hit when you're when you're using QCal2. Um, I don't think it's 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 too much. I heard three percent earlier. I've heard seven percent before. Um, it's certainly you, you gain a lot of space savings. So I would, I would highly suggest that uh, investigate QCal2 for your images if you're if you're going to be making your own versus taking someone else's. Some of the other formats that have been added. Uh, did that, I only show three up there, but I think Glance supports seven or eight now, which include like VMDKs, ISOs. Uh, there's there's actually a a significant number of formats that, that Glance does support. So speaking on Glance, um, there's a couple options there on where you're going to store your, your images. So, so Glance is essentially the service that provides images for the compute nodes, the boot instances on. Uh, file backed is, is going to be probably the most common until you, you reach a size where that becomes unrealistic. Uh, you have some alternatives, right? So you have Swift. If you want to run Swift internally, you can point Glance to Swift. Rackspace Cloud Files you can point to. Uh, you can point to S3 if you wanted. Uh, you could also do something like NFS where it's locally mounted as a you know, varlib Glance and you have all this space available to you. That's certainly an option as well. Uh, as far as performance goes, uh, uh, the, the file backed local is going to be your best bet, but you're limited on you know, how much space you have in that one physical server that's, that's performing that file that's, that's back in Glance. Uh, as far as snapshots go, you know, it's, it's realistically hard to guess what your users are going to be doing. You know, are they going to be snapshotting? Or are they not going to be snapshotting? Um, that starts to become a, a sizing consideration, right? So all of a sudden, you know, your two terabytes of disk on your controller, uh, if I've got you know, a thousand instances running. Any of them could be snapshotting at any given point in time. How do you deal with that that space, right? So, um, I believe that Grizzly actually brings, and I know this is a fulsome talk, but I, I believe that Grizzly brings uh, some features where you can actually pick where the snapshots go, which don't necessarily have to be the same place as Glance or where the, your Glance backend is. Um, so it's worth looking into. Uh, definitely take it into consideration when you're building out the disk space on that Glance server. Right. It's uh, it, for as far as QCal goes. So we, uh, I, I heard so much of the the stuff that I've been talking about in the, the last talk about images. Um, one of the the best benefits uh, for using QCal right now is that your uh, so when you have QCal, the base image gets copied over to the compute node when you're spinning up an instance and creates a QCal file, uh, and then it uses that as the local disk for the instance. Right. So if I only have, say, one base image, as soon as I have an instance on every compute node, my base image has already been cached, basically, on each compute node. And so each instance takes um, about a second to get going, right? That versus the, the flip side of that is if I have a very large image, very large raw file, and I have to copy all that data over every time my image boots. So if I've got 20 different images, um, my local cache you know, kind of becomes pointless. So, my whole point there is it's simpler to standardize on less images and you know, leverage automation and orchestration techniques to actually build uh, the stack that's going to go on it. So this is, uh, this is one of those things that I, I don't think a lot of people necessarily think about, but um, glance performance. So network throughput becomes really interesting. Uh, you, know, you could easily consume an entire gig throughput just trying to copy an image over, especially if it's a very large image. Uh, if you're sharing Glance with uh, the rest of your services, so like on our controllers, Glance is running also. Right? The Glance registry and uh, Glance API as well as the back store is there. You could easily consume your entire network just with a, an, an image copy that happens every time your instance boots. So certainly take network throughput, in, new th network throughput into account. Uh, you may want to look at RAID 5 just due to the large sequential read and writes that Glance performs. Uh, we, we tend to go RAID 10 as much as possible, but RAID 5 is, is certainly doable, especially if you want more disk space. You may want to prefer disk bandwidth over raw IOPS. Right? You're not doing a lot of small read and writes. You're, you're consuming uh, very large sequential, sequential blocks. So disk bandwidth uh, may, be the, may be worth looking at. Uh, and what I, what I talked about earlier was uh, Improve the cache, so reduce, reduce the number of images that you're letting people use. Um, that, that's basically what I, what I talked about earlier. If I have a, you know, a 
not cached 1.4 gig, you know, gigabyte image. It takes me 20 seconds to copy that over and boot it. Um, but it's not too long, it's not too bad, but once it's cached, it takes, takes a second. Right? All of a sudden, that, that's quite a bit, big difference. And especially if you start looking at larger images, like Windows images that are 16, 17, right, into the teens of gigs, that takes time to copy that data over, um, and it will consume your network while it's doing that. And it will also consume I.O. on both your controller and your compute node. Right? And so that's I.O. that you're competing with your instances on. So the more you can cache, the more you, you have like cache hits on your compute nodes, the, the better off everyone's going to be. Uh, that, that's just the, the, how I measure the time. Uh, it's, the, last, the last thing I want to touch on for images and storage, basically, there's four focus points um, for, for storage. It's basically um, Glance, Compute, uh, Cinder, and Swift. So Glance, uh, you're really focused on space, as, as like I was saying earlier, sequential read and writes. Uh, for compute, you're really going to be focused on random I.O., because right? that's where all of your instances are running. Uh, they're going to be all competing for that I.O. time. So a few hundred IOPS you know, across 20 instances, maybe all of a sudden you know, not so good. Um, so, so really look at random, you know, building for random I.O. Uh, it's probably RAID 10 or SSDs if you, if you got them. Uh, Cinder, really looking for performance, including network performance, because that is iSCSI, and uh, uh, also density as well. So making full use of your head unit. So if your head unit has a lot of cores, you want to make sure that you're building the right density of cinder disks with it. If you're, you know, if you've got a really beefy cinder node, um, you might be wasting a lot of your CPU resources. Um, other, you know, also don't don't forget about uh, things like interrupts, right? So if I'm on a 10 gig network, I now have to worry about how much, how many cores my interrupts are consuming at 10 gigs, if my cinder nodes are are being used heavily. Uh, and then for Swift. Um, Swift is, is basically JBODs, and, and you're mostly worried about density there. Uh, it's not really going into any of the network considerations for Swift. All right, so some, just some architecture examples and thoughts. Um, these are the same ones I, I, I used last year for the most part. So 1 to 20 physical servers uh, is, is relatively simple to build. Um, we use a single controller, or now we have HA, so you may have two controllers. Um, single API endpoint, which again with HA, you, you may have uh, load balanced API endpoints, and uh, you know you may have a single network, right? So everything's running on on one network, um, one gigabit or two gigabit with some some aggregate bonding uh, is probably going to be fine for for that size environment. Uh, just so you guys know, a controller to us is basically MySQL, Rabbit, Keystone, uh, all the APIs, so Glance, Nova, um, uh, the VNC, Horizon. Uh, what else is on there? The scheduler. Uh, basically, all the processes besides Nova Compute, Nova Network, and Nova Metadata. Um, everything else is, is basically running on the controller uh, in our world. So network utilization, I, I say one or two gigabits is fine, but obviously that, that, you know, that your workloads are going to be completely different from everyone else's workloads. So just, just plan accordingly for the, for the network throughput piece. As far as uh, 20 to 100 servers go, it's really not probably a whole lot different. Um, obviously, I'd, I'd recommend looking at HA controllers uh, and load balanced APIs. Uh, Swift, Swift or Cloud Files, right, for, for back end to glance to deal with snapshots and, and you know, the more images that your users might be consuming. Uh, that, the major thing there is, is what I talked about earlier was uh, you, you really might want to look at limiting the images and the flavors that, that your users can, can consume. If everybody can upload images, you know, you're going you're gonna to consume that space real fast. Uh, you may want to look at availability zones to separate out hardware based on some, some characteristic. Um, availability zones, though, is, is essentially going away in Grizzly, or it might still be there, but it's the concept of cells is coming in, which is, uh, which is really interesting. You may also want to consider front-end and back-end networks. So in sort of this model here where um, basically I've got my fixed IPs on a completely diff different interface, so my VM to VM traffic is happening on, say, ETH1 of my compute node. Uh, but my um, you know, Nova Compute talking to Rabbit, all my Nova services, Glance, is that all that's happening on ETH0. Right? So I've, I've separated out those, those network workloads. Uh, I do have Cinder on, on the same network space here, but, but you can have a dedicated Cinder network as well. Uh, certainly, if you have a large block storage installation, you'll probably want to do that. Um, as far as metrics, collecting metrics on compute nodes, at, at this many servers, uh, 
uh, you're probably actually going to want dedicated machines on that. We've seen it at somewhere around 40 or 50 servers that uh, the I.O. for collecting uh, you know, all the metrics possible from a compute node uh, starts, to become, uh, starts to become pretty heavy, about 40 or 50 physical servers. So some just performance considerations and bottlenecks. Uh, I, I think that I.O. is most likely going to be your, your problem. Um, like I was saying earlier, random I.O. Becomes, becomes quite a big deal on the compute nodes, depending on how, how many instances you're running. Um, you're you're going to want to try your best to reduce as much I.O. per instance uh, overall. Block storage helps a lot there. So all of your major I.O. operations, so like databases, right, are pretty heavy. Um, anything that's reading a lot from disks, you'll probably want to look at block storage. Just get, that, get the I.O. off your local disks and, and, and throw it in Cinder. Um, but that does cause more networking problems. So it's certainly something we're thinking about. Uh, review hypervisor best practices. That's the other thing. Um, you know, depending on what hypervisor you're using, there's probably a best practice on how to build those images. So uh, we, we chose Vert.io for now, but the vhost net module looks you know, pretty promising uh, for performance considerations, right? So I would certainly make sure that you're, you're building it correctly for your, your selected hypervisor. I guess I should have put that on the first slide. That's the first thing you have to figure out. What hypervisor? What hypervisor are you going to pick? I, I don't know how many we're up to now. Five or six um, hypervisors. That's probably the first thing you should figure out when you're building one of these. Uh, some lessons learned. Um, floating IPs must be associated with the flag public interface. That's been an interesting one that we've been uh, fighting somewhat. Um, the public interface flag sets up a number of IP tables rules. I'm um, we'll going to go into that a little bit in my, talk, my Nova Network talk tomorrow. Um, but basically, your floating IPs in that network needs to be associated, needs to be available on that interface in VLAN that uh, public interface is set to. Um, each piece of OpenStack has its own architecture, right? So there's uh, people like to show that really complicated uh, diagram from Ken um, Pebbles' site. Uh, it was on the, the uh, images talk earlier. Or it was on one of the talks earlier. Uh, it's, it's actually, OpenStack still pretty complicated, right? Each piece has its own architecture. Uh, Swift has its completely own architecture, right? Cinder basically has its own architecture. Uh, Nova has its own architecture. So make sure you, you focus on uh, all of them and not just, not just one. Uh, Folsom is stable. We, you know, like I said, we've been running it for customers for the last five or six months. Um, the, everything, ever since Essex, OpenStack's getting more and more stable. So if you're still wondering if OpenStack's stable or not, uh, I wouldn't even, I I wouldn't even question at this point, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what Grizzly's bringing. Uh, migration, so either live or block, works, uh, but there are certainly situations where it doesn't work. Uh, I would suggest, if at all possible, don't rely on these mechanisms. Um, I know some of, the, some, of the, some of the other private cloud vendors are doing some stuff to make live migration work really well. Um, I think that comes back to the discussion on, are you building traditional VMware, or are you building an elastic cloud? Right? In an elastic cloud world, live migration shouldn't matter to you, um, but that's kind of a hard, hard place to get to. Uh, so OpenStack keeps changing, obviously. Right? That's why we're all here. So keep, keep up to date on all the uh, current projects. Uh, that, that would be the other thing. You know, we're up to uh, five or six core projects, but there's another 10 or 12 smaller projects uh, that people are talking about pretty heavily now. So uh, you know, Heat and Slometer. Uh, Oslo, this triple O, right? OpenStack and OpenStack. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on now. So keep up to date with the community. And the other thing I added this real recently was don't do heterogeneous nodes. That actually means from like a network standpoint, right? It's actually okay from, from a compute standpoint because the schedulers, scheduler is going to deal with that, right? It's going to put resources where you have resources. Or it's going to put instances where you have resources. But from a networking standpoint, I'm not sure if anybody actually is doing heterogeneous nodes. Does anyone? Does anyone have their networking that looks different? Yeah, all right. Uh, so pretty much every slide here could, could probably be its own talk, right? Uh, you could have your own talk about networking. You have your own talk, talk about Glance. You could have an entire talk about Keystone and, and everything else. Um, trying to cram it all into one is, is kind of difficult. But uh, certainly think about every project when you're uh, building your private cloud. And this is, uh, this is pretty much it. So some operational updates from Folsom. Uh, Last year, I gave a talk about an op, you know, operating OpenStack. I'm not giving one this year. 
But uh, there were a number of uh, new Nova calls added. So there's like the hypervisor list, hypervisor stats. There's a new, there's a number of calls that were added to Nova so that you can actually get statistics from your hypervisor about utilization and instances running there. So um, you know, make sure to, to, to use that. Uh, image types and glance, I talked about that earlier as well. We, we have new format types. Um, you know, the policy.json, highly recommend investigating that if you're looking at limiting API calls based on role. Uh, you may want to look at the, the policy.json files. And then what's coming in Grizzly, the, the main things, at least in my opinion, are the cells concept, um, you know, quantum for networking. Quantum was here in Folsom, but I think it's actually probably ready in, in Grizzly. And then uh, better LDAP and AD support is one of the, the big things that, that we're hoping, uh, hoping for. And that's pretty much it. So this is also a design summit. Um, so completely open to, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, questions, discussions, thoughts? Anyone? Yeah. I've actually wondered that myself. Um, I haven't looked into that. I, I believe it, it I, I don't know, does anyone know the answer to that question? So the question is, if you have Swift backed into Glance, does every compute node, when you're booting an instance, does the image get delivered from Swift to the compute node, or does it go through the controller and get delivered by the Glance process? In Folsom, it's a Folsom that delivers OS. Okay, in Folsom, but in Grizzly, that sounds like in Grizzly it does not. Okay, so the compute host will actually pull it? Yeah. Okay. So in Folsom, it sounds like it, it does, which is what we're talking about. But since you know, Grizzly has been released, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I've actually wondered that myself. I just haven't investigated it. Yeah? Yeah. So how how do you know your how do you how do you know ahead of time the utilization? How much load is posted, you know, by the application that the customer? How do you yeah. how do you get this information? So he's he's basically wondering how do you how do you find all the information about utilization performance uh, when like before moving over to a private or to build private cloud, right? But how do you get this from your existing world, well, like? Oh right. Yeah, so that's probably a, a you know a pretty traditional requirements gathering effort. So um, if they already have that workload somewhere, then you can obviously re you can gather the performance of what it what it requires, right? So if they're already run it becomes very application centric also. So you want to focus on one piece of that or one application and and find its you know IOPS its network throughput. If it's already running, if it's not already running, I, I mean that that becomes a conversation with the customer, right? How do you uh, how do, what do they think they're actually going to be consuming? Um, I don't think there's a magic bullet there. Um, but obviously, if it's, it's a workload already running, you can gather those metrics through any number of systems that exist. I, I just don't think, I don't think there's a, a simple magic answer. Um, obviously, if you're designing as like a service provider or like a public cloud model, um, it's a little different, right? Where you're basically saying, this is what we're going to put out. Uh, you have to use this. Um, that's, a, that's a little different story, right? Um, so are you building to customize for their application, or are you building to be a service provider, which is not going to be customized for anybody. It's just going to be, it's just going to be a model that you have to consume. I think that's a decision you have to make. And once you have the money, how do you, how, what, what tools do you use to really try to put the design off to the side? So, sorry, I didn't follow. What was that? So once you have these numbers, you know how many IOPS is needed, how mm -hmm. many So the question is, once you have the numbers, how do you how do you build for that? Uh, I, I mean, again, I think that's traditional architecture, right? This is we're still running Linux infrastructure. So if I know my you know x number of IOPS and I know my uh, you know my throughput requirements, I can certainly still build for that. Um, that that's I, I think pretty standard. I, I don't think that really changes, to be honest. Um, now there may be performance considerations based on what like hypervisor you're using and you know what kind of performance you're going to lose. Um, 
you know, how much percent of a performance you're going to lose. But I don't think that that changes too much actually from from traditional Linux architecture. So uh, I got a couple questions right here. So, okay, you, yeah, you have, so you have customers that have requirements to use different hypervisors. Yeah. Is that because they have existing hypervisors or like they want Hyper-V because they have a bunch of windows and they want KVM for like free, right? Um, I, 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 so we don't, we don't run multiple hypervisors in our, in our uh, private clouds. Um, I probably right now wouldn't suggest doing it. Um, but also theoretically, it can be done. I, I have no experience with it. I, I really can't say one way or another. I wouldn't recommend it though. Or, uh, right here. So in our HA, and these guys, a couple of these guys might actually be able to an answer it better, but I believe for those services that you can't run multiple of, we're restarting them on a failover, right? So that pretty much. I don't know, Brewer Shep, do you guys have a uh, tie in on there? Yeah, we, uh, we didn't use Pacemaker and CoreSync, so we're leveraging uh, Keep Alive D. Uh, we can, there's a, <laughs> the team that's like really worked a lot on HA is here, so if we have more questions afterwards, we can certainly we can pick their brains. If you have a question on how they're how they're pulling that off, um, right here. Um, so I again, I'm not overly experienced with the VMware use case. Um, I haven't built a VMware private cloud with with OpenStack. Um, Okay, so so to use floating IPs or to not use floating IPs? Yeah. Um, that that's certainly tricky. That that becomes one of those questions of do you are you should you even actually try and forklift an application that's not cloud aware and put it on the cloud right in an elastic cloud? Um, that that I think is a million dollar question. Like that is becomes a problem that a lot of people are having right now. They're trying to do that and they're running into problems. It's like trying to do traditional HA and OpenStack, like on top of OpenStack, right? That you can't really do that. Um, I don't know if there's any good fencing mechanisms for moving a floating IP. Um, I, I really think that just forklifting a, a traditional application over and just throwing it on top of OpenStack is a, a bad practice, um, uh, but it's certainly gonna be one that a lot of people are doing, so. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. That was a two to one oversubscription. Um, we we don't uh, we we let customers decide what they want their oversubscription to be. So since that's uh, a flag and a, a process restart, it's pretty simple to increase it later. Um, we start at two to one, and we don't oversubscribe memory currently. Um, if if a customer wanted four to one, eight to one, twelve to one, I mean they could we could certainly increase it for them. Yeah, we want them to establish their workloads uh, and then look at utilization and, and bump it up from there. Uh, more questions here. Would you ever set brand strongly uh, uh, what you think back there? No. Um, I, I think that RAM is, I think it's RAM or disk space, uh, to be honest. What's that? Disk IO could certainly be, it certainly can be a, a problem. I actually think it's a bigger issue than than RAM or disk space uh, as far as performance goes. Um, I, I would probably agree with you, RAM, when you boil it down, is, is really gonna be your, your how you're kind of limited to that amount of RAM. Um, certainly, vCPUs can be over committed a lot easier, right? That's a pretty easy process to, to deal with. Um, but, I, but, but RAM is, is pretty much a gating factor. I, I would agree with that, yeah. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish, right? So through, if you have very large, so he's asking about network performance. Is it more latency focused or is it more throughput focused? Um, again, I, I, things don't really change from a traditional architecture there. Um, if my 
if my if I'm storing stuff in like Rackspace Cloud Files, I now have a latency problem, right? I also have a throughput problem, but it's not going to be nearly as fast as my local disks a hop away, right? I'm now going to a public cloud provider, um, and so it's going to naturally be a lot slower. But I have infinite amount of space space I can use. Um, if I start thinking about instance to instance communication, uh, latency might become an issue, but uh, throughput is certainly going to be a concern because now on, it's, that's a traditional virtualization problem, right? If I've got 10 VMs running on a hypervisor and a one gigabit pipe, that's all I'm going to get out of it, right? I, I'll never get any more. Um, so I, I, again, I don't think that changes too much from the traditional virtualization model. So I would say that actually a lot of building an OpenStack cloud doesn't differ that too, too far from a traditional model right? at the infrastructure layer. But there are things that you have to account for, which are like Glance. And it, Swift, is, Swift is, a, is a different animal as well. Um, I, would, I would argue that it's not too far different, right? Right. So yeah, that that so he brings up the shared storage piece. There, but I would argue that um, a lot of people in here are probably using shared storage for their instances. Uh, I don't. I, I personally like. So my thoughts on that are that you should really be focused on building elastic nature and not dealing with shared storage um, ever. But there's certainly a lot of people who build it that way. So that was kind of touches back to my first point of is you kind of need to make a decision. Are you building traditional virtualization, or are you you're trying to build for elastic nature? Uh, there was a talk or a question over here. Um, have you considered uh, when you think private uh, network, you usually have uh, multiple data centers, and uh, you know, each one having their own source. And then uh, the issue of glance and then the image being transferred over the network. Is, is there a so the question is basically, if I have multiple data centers, right, geographically separated, um, and then like performance of glance copying between one or the other. Uh, I would probably actually uh, point, put my glance images in a public cloud provider uh, and then use the URL and, and ask the system, systems to pull down the glance images um, would, be, would probably be the, the model I would go instead of storing them locally. Uh, or at least in Grizzly, as we learned earlier, right? In Folsom, you might not have the option. Uh, I, I didn't talk on that. Um, in Glance, you, you don't actually have to have a file backed, right? You can actually store a URL location of an image. So you could have the image could be sitting on someone Ubuntu's website, right? Or the image could be in a private container and or a container in cloud files. Um, you don't actually have to store the image locally, but obviously going out and making that request is going to take additional time, right? So that becomes a, a, a like a convenience factor over uh, speed. Right. Yeah, the complexity from uh, with the advantage of private cloud becomes far more because there are specific images, custom images, you know, being requested, and and you know, it's very difficult to standardize unless you have something like you know, your building and then an instance on the run. Yeah. Just just having your own set of I I would say strive for less images and and standardize if if possible, but certainly as as is one of the questions brought up earlier. People are trying to move workloads over and not thinking about it from the ground up, right? How do I how do I stack this instance um, versus just having a, a image that is like this very important, you know, my one specific application image, right? Um, that's that's the those are the questions that people keep having. Um, it's hard to force a business to try and move, right? I, I get that, but I, I think you want to try. So, yeah. Um, that's pretty much time, I believe. Is that correct? Um, I'll be yeah. I'll be I'll be around. Uh, there's a number of other uh, private cloud guys in the room from Rackspace. Be glad to answer any questions you guys have.